In some of our greatest wars on this world, we have seen entire regions covered in fortifications. But in great wars across whole regions of our galaxy, could we see entire planets fortified? One of the most common themes we have on this show is that a future out in the galaxy isn't one where most people live on planets, but rather in space habitats or deep inside asteroids or smaller moons. While I was pondering the topic for today, of Fortress Worlds, which is an informal sequel to our Hive Worlds and Forge Worlds episodes, I found myself confronting some of the classic flaws of science fiction. We have two key ones to begin with and the first is that in sci-fi we have these big galaxy-wide wars in which a planet is a mere minor battlefield and is taken by a few thousand troops in a few days. In reality it would seem like a battle for a planet should require millions of troops, potentially billions, and might take years or even decades. The two world wars of last century give us some context. World War I was mostly confined to Europe and the neighboring regions of Africa and Asia, and even World War II had many neutral parties or those with low involvement, and yet they both lasted several years and claimed 10 million soldiers' lives in the first war and 15 million in the second, with far more wounded in mind or body or both, and civilian casualties beyond any count. Estimates put the total number of troops mobilized for World War II by all sides at 127 million, It is easy for us to imagine that more high-tech wars would have fewer forces involved, but in reality more high-tech civilizations can stand up an even larger percentage of their population as soldiers, keep them fed and equipped longer, and sustain far more people overall. A 1% mobilization of all humanity these days would equal 80 million people, and we would have little problem maintaining that indefinitely except presumably that an alien invader would be pounding our infrastructure into the dirt by orbital bombardment. Which brings up the second big flaw of science fiction when it comes to planetary invasions, and one we've analyzed before, and that's the idea that a bunch of ships up in orbit enjoy some sort of tactical advantage over those below. Which is true enough, but spaceships are by their nature pretty thin and small, Even something the size of a mountain, as we sometimes see in sci-fi, for very large battleships, is still hollow and needs vast energy to move around, and more for every inch of armor. Whereas there are a million actual mountains on Earth and they are not hollow, and they are just tiny bumps on the planet's enormous surface. You can lob stuff down at that planet and enjoy gravity aiding you while it hurts any return fire from below. But Earth's gravity and escape velocity are pretty minimal compared to even slow interstellar travel speeds, and a thousand spaceships hurling munitions with an advantage of gravity probably doesn't mean much against a million ground-based mega cannons. We might imagine them nuking us from above, but why aren't our own missiles carrying warheads up to nuke them too? Those ships would be more fragile than our planet is. Generally, even a megaton warhead cannot reliably take out a modest bunker less than a kilometer from its impact site, and Earth's surface area is half a billion square kilometers. That's a lot of nukes and you would need more to penetrate deeper and tougher bunkers, and you would need one heck of a huge fleet to absorb half a billion megaton nukes detonating near you. Obviously in a lot of scenarios in sci-fi, the situation involves us at the present level of technology trying to fight off some huge alien armada, but for today we'll be assuming a conflict between forces with at least some degree of parity. If not equal in tech or resources, then no more unbalanced than we might see between a modern superpower and a smaller nation-state, not what it would be like if an interstellar civilization came at us right now where the comparison might be more like the combined might of NATO kicking in the door at a daycare facility. We discuss this in more detail along with making Planetfall with a ground force and why you would, rather than nuking everything, back in this summer's episode Dropships, and what we saw is that there's a lot of scenarios where you might be doing the Planetfall invasion without having space and air superiority established and that planets might not be able to just blow your fleet away because they are very likely to have thousands, if not millions, of large orbital facilities, which themselves might range from very damage-sensitive power collector arrays or civilian field O'Neill cylinders 
to huge asteroids converted into defense stations that could shrug off direct nuclear strikes. Those themselves would be an example of a fortress world, and trying to seize one would be a nightmare, invading through unknown thousands of miles of tunnels and vaults. One getting smashed to pieces in orbit is potentially a nightmare for either side too. An invasion fleet can blow all your orbitals to pieces, although those orbitals probably vastly outmass any incoming fleet and may have way more tonnage of weapons too so they might wreck your fleet. But if that fleet wrecks them, not only have they destroyed that planet's valuable orbital infrastructure, which they might need to rebuild later, but they have also put trillions of tons of hypervelocity shrapnel in orbit, shrapnel which will persist and hamper their invasion effort in an extreme case of Kessler Syndrome, and possibly wreck their ships and dropships, with each wreck adding to the shrapnel. The planet below is better protected from that, both by an atmosphere things can burn up in and thick rock to hide under. And as soon as you wreck all their orbital infrastructure they can start launching nukes at your fleet wholesale, which will be at top speed when they enter the debris zone and only there for a few minutes or even seconds, and thus are far less likely to be damaged by that debris than your fleet is. So an invasion fleet and the defender both have good reason not to go crazy with the super WMD options. It is not as effective as it sounds like, even if Scorched Earth is okay with you, but that also means that you can be contemplating landing wave after wave of troops and decoy dropships, again see that episode for details. I should probably note that some kilometers long battle cruiser could also potentially be housing a hundred million shock troops, or huge tanks, mecha, or machine mines and killbots. The value of your typical sci-fi spaceship is often ludicrous to its mission and crew size. The Galaxy-class starship, the USS Enterprise-D, had somewhere around 10 million square feet or a million square meters of decks, and a crew of a thousand, several times the area of an aircraft carrier, which is far more packed since it has several times the crew. But when you consider options like stasis pods and food replicators, that ship might cram in a lot more crew and the big ships we see in Warhammer 40,000, from which we are borrowing the terms Fortress Ward, Hive Ward, and Forge Ward, ought to be able to pack millions of soldiers into one of those ships. Which is a long way of saying that there's both potential motivation for a ground invasion and a realistic scenario for dumping tens of millions of invaders down the gravity well. But let's take this a step further and consider two other scenarios. First, to look at how a planet might be a war zone inside something like a Kardashev II Dyson Swarm Civilization, and second, how we might see a multi-generational war being conducted on a planet as it fortified, as well as a second attempt down the road after the invaders lost and coming back to that war a few generations later with another battle host. Now our first case is fairly straightforward to contemplate. We often imagine our solar system, maybe a few millennia hence, as the de facto center of a loose-knit group of colonies spread over maybe a couple hundred light years by then, which would include somewhere around 100,000 star systems like our own, but probably only a handful of which would yet be sporting populations in the billions. Alternatively, back here in the solar system, Earth might have several trillion people living on or in orbit of it, with trillions more spread around the asteroid belt and all the various minor planets. This may be one happy empire of peace and love, or it might be a million nations, many of which were scores of loosely lined space habitats whose capital was a skyscraper embassy on Earth with a smaller ground area than Vatican City. Earth might have thousands of nations of billions of citizens living on it, and ten times that number of little microstates on the ground that were each representing some interstellar colony system or some multi-billion person asteroid mining kingdom. That is not a place you want to be trying to pound your enemy into the ground with nukes or even artillery, when collateral damage might provoke a war with some empire of a billion souls. It sounds like a place for commando squads and urban combat equipped infantry, but we should keep in mind that still doesn't imply hundreds of troops. The Vesta Compact of Asteroid Colonies, population 1 trillion, might try dropping a hundred million soldiers into the Alcology Cantons of Switzerland, 5000 AD. And if you thought invading modern Switzerland was a nightmare, it's got nothing on what Vesta's stormtroopers faced. Numerous though they are, they'd have been wiped out, 
if they weren't already highly trained in fighting inside tight tunnels in floating mountains in space. But what do we mean by fortified, and does this really only apply if the enemy isn't using heavy artillery, orbital bombardment, and nukes? In truth, no, because an entire planet could be done up in trenches and bunkers like we saw during the World Wars, and while mega fortifications like the Maginot Line tend to get mocked as having not worked, it doesn't really invalidate the idea or mean it would not have worked with some modifications, including extension to the entire land border. There's a ton of books and videos discussing World War II and most mention the Maginot Line, but the one paragraph summary was that the French built it on the German border between World War I and II and it was a daunting series of fortifications that no one sane would attack. It had underground railways for resupply of heavily fortified defense bunkers and would be fairly resistant even to nuclear strikes. Most of my time in the army was spent in artillery and infantry roles and I was stationed in Germany for a lot of it, so armchair quarterbacking those wars was a common hobby in the barracks and yes, modern forces have some advantages there. Our weapons are very accurate, so we could drop a laser dot on a gun port of a bunker with a recon troop or drone and put guided missiles or artillery shells right through the window to get everyone where a shell exploding right on it would just crack some concrete and rebar, but there are tons of ways to screw with those sorts of technologies. Smoke, your own lasers tricking the guidance package, GPS jamming, point defense systems, armored glass or just not having windows, and many more. The conclusion being that yes, we could wreck the Maginot Line in a direct attack, unless we were defending it and had some prep time too, which is kinda the point. Wars between roughly equal powers tend not to happen unless one side thinks it has some unbeatable edge, which also often has some expiration date before the other side finds out and figures out a counter, and so they go to war while they have this edge. No sane army fights another army that's vaguely equal, that's the first rule of warfare after all, never pick on someone your own size. This is especially true if they're on the defense, had prep time, and have fortified the place. If that's the case, go find another hobby for a few generations. If your enemy has built an invincible fortress, let them stay inside it, digging them out tends to be expensive. Of course sometimes the attacked might feel they really need that symbolic win, and a lot of times it made sense historically, they just lacked the full picture. Meat grinders like Stalingrad come to mind but even where strategic interest might be mistaken, they might really need that place as it's their religious holy land, or the current regime swore they'd take it back during their rise to power, or maybe it's their traditional homeland. People might go to extreme lengths to retake that or defend that, and that could be something like your whole population being willing to live as brains in jars in huge and efficient underground vaults, where they remotely pilot robots in industry and battle or can be manually installed into them too. Everyone's body might be on ice for eventual restoration when rationing ends, your brain would need roughly a tenth the daily calories you do. Indeed you might freeze the surplus population till then, it's a very low energy process to maintain someone that way, and then your kids can, in theory at least, awaken to a time of peace and prosperity after the war. Those soldiers who die in it still don't get to raise their kids but the survivors get to return and thaw them out without missing any of that time with them. You might not need them to grow up to be soldiers, as you might use brain scanning to replace your losses, or be able to infinitely repair and regenerate your brains and jaws in armored vaults. One day your citizens will reawaken to a world free of war and rebuilt into a paradise. Until then, they're safe. And this need not be a war either. You might be fortified against an expected supernova of a neighboring star, or have decided to flee your own solar system and fortified your planet up to survive the eternal night of interstellar travel for a 10,000 year journey to a safe system, as your own star goes red giant and when you arrive you unfreeze and rebuild. See our Planet Ships episode for how to go about moving an entire planet. Now let's consider an entire planet that's been invaded and in an environment where it's part of a larger empire and under attack from another empire that's willing and able to throw so many waves of troops at it that you could make a literal mountain out of their bodies. 
which incidentally would tend to imply around a trillion bodies, more than a hundred times as many humans as currently alive, and ten times the estimated human population over our entire history. Or a trillion war robots or clone soldiers or androids with uploaded minds of super soldiers on them. We are not using actual 19th and 20th century soldiers in this, even if the scenarios hulk into those conflicts. You cannot assume your nerve gas bombs or virus attacks are going to do anything to the enemy's cyborg armies, see that episode for details, or regular humans in power armor, or genetically engineered superhumans in power armor. And since we are heavily borrowing from Warhammer today already, not to mention everyone from Terry Pratchett to Ian M. Banks, let's talk about the planet Krieg for a moment. It's one of the many worlds in the fictional 40k universe that was never a great place to live on in the first place, but at one point Krieg had a rebellion from the wider Imperium and a counterattack by Loyalists when they found out that reinforcements from abroad weren't coming anytime soon, and was basically, launch all missiles. This reduced the planet to a toxic and radioactive hellscape, after which the Imperium assumed everyone was dead and didn't bother investigating further till they got a signal 500 years later saying the Rebels were finally dead and they wanted to join back up. In reality, the two sides still had quite a lot of survivors after the Doomsday event, especially their soldiers, many of whom had enough warning to get to bunkers, and now they were obsessed with killing each other off. Everybody fought in hazmat gear or never taking off their gas masks, and had carved out more and more underground facilities and factories for making guns and ammo. They grow the whole population in tubes since the lifestyle there doesn't lend itself to long healthy lives, fertility, and safe childbearing, and their soldiers are basically indoctrinated on the idea that they live only for war, will do anything to win it, and that dying for the cause is a nice consolation prize. This violates the first rule of warfare, which reminds us that the goal of soldiers is not to die for their country, but to get the enemy to die for theirs. So if your enemy is willing to die for their cause, you provide assistance with that goal, and since this usually involves crazed fanaticism, it generally isn't great compared to level-headed professionalism. Nonetheless, the Death Corps of Krieg, as they are rightly named, excel at storming fortifications and surviving physically and mentally crushing battlefield conditions since that's basically their whole planet and recent history. Could you do that? Well, yes, I've worn gas masks for hours at a time in the army, and they are worse than the ones most everybody wore during Covid, but probably something you can't adjust to and that's assuming nobody came up with something more comfortable. But hazmat suits, space suits, and body armor have a lot of points of overlap, they all do each other's jobs to some degree. After all, thicker armor is more radiation shielding and less air leakage out, or toxins from an external and dangerous environment. Also it is very plausible that battle armor and spacesuits of the future would be ultra comfortable affairs with built in heating and cooling, sweat collection and crystal clear audio and video, all with an internal power supply and strength reinforcing exoskeleton. We discussed that along with the cybernetic approach in our episode Cyborg Armies, and there's a lot of options for keeping folks sane in conditions like that, or at least a decent approximation of sanity for the purpose of carrying on the conflict. For example, you do not need a muddy trench full of rotting matter and waste, a metal vault would work better and could be kept clean by elbow grease and robots even if you're restricted on AI use to modern levels. It could even have showers, comfortable lighting, and a decent bed, with access to vast archives of data and entertainment even if the internet went down, or potentially entire libraries of virtual realities for entertainment and training, because if you got good VR it's likely to be invaluable not just for entertainment but skills and combat training, as well as psychological assessment and treatment. I suspect there are a lot of folks who would be able to handle years of trench warfare if most of their time was spent in such a vault. So too, even ignoring the use of artificial intelligence for scanning an area with cameras and other sensors, and for picking out and aiming at targets, a big fortress network with lots of redundant and buried lines can have lots of sentinels and monitors way back from the front and operating remotely so that forces on hand might be principally for repelling attacks till reinforcements arrive and providing redundancy for power or communication failures. 
So much depends on the technology available, but for instance, while it would be awesome to have compact fusion reactors, any modest bunker could comfortably and safely run on an internal fission reactor, and as we covered elsewhere, if you are comfortable using breeder reactors, then any given planet has a very large and long term fuel supply of uranium and thorium. Given that it's a fortress environment, I'm thinking concern over nuclear proliferation is out the window, though I suppose they might be even more concerned about it than we are, nothing like having your whole civilization inside fallout shelters to make one passionate about nuclear safety, or casually indifferent to it. But a fortress planet hardly needs to be a garbage heap. As compelling as World War I trench environments are from history and for fiction and storytelling, there's no reason why you might not be having grass lawns and gardens all over your bunkers, especially if your fortifications were not built on the fly. So too, if you have options like fusion power, even just basic deuterium fusion, then your underground facilities or hollowed out mountains can be both immense and green. You can grow food in underground hydroponics or even in elaborate gardens, and anyone fortifying an entire planet has some experience with such technology because it's the default way almost every space colony got started, and you're not having planetary invasions if you haven't got a lot of space colonies already. We'll be looking at options for domes on Mars in a few weeks, and one of the concerns there is always how fragile a dome is, and as we'll see, it is entirely plausible the thing might be made out of diamond or other super strong materials, so that they survive meteor strikes or heavy caliber gunfire. Even then, you're often going to want the protection of thick cheap rock and regolith overhead, and in low gravity environments it's very easy to dig out and buttress chambers bigger than a football field and light them like a normal day. Depending on automation levels, you might put domes made of diamond in a crater on some airless planet or moon, and put huge blast doors over it instead of bulldozing tons of dirt over top in event of an impending attack. After all, a blast shield that can rotate over your dome sure is handy for any number of reasons, and on coral planets you could pump water or mud into the space between the doors and dome and let it freeze as extra cheap armor. There's an anime called Evangelion, best known for its giant mecha and very strange ending where the giant alien invaders keep trying to attack Tokyo specifically, and so all the buildings can retract down underground during these attacks to keep people safe. When I first saw that I thought it was crazy, but when I considered it more it is actually a doable approach and one that would fit well with options we've discussed elsewhere. For instance we talk about how space habitats can move in their entirety if they don't like their neighbors but could also have plots or docks like a marina for houseboats only for spaceship houses where people attach their home to the outside hull and pop their house into the habitat, and can be retracted if they want to leave and be replaced by a new immigrant, but anyone with that setup and concerns of hostile actions might modify and piggyback that system so that everything withdrew into the ground for safety if there was a big hull breach or attack. Massive automation and AI leaves a lot of options open, which would otherwise seem absurd. One of which is that people might be leading normal lives while trillions of battle bots and a relative handful of soldiers are engaging in huge land battles nearby, safe in their underground bunkers with huge vaulting spaces and beautiful, if artificial, land, sea, and sky. Indeed this may be the normal life of an asteroid colony, of which we may have hundreds of thousands by the turn of the millennia. And it is worth remembering that proximity and stress are related more by a feeling of it than the physical reality, so a war on the other side of the planet nowadays doesn't feel terribly proximate to us, in a sense of seriously disrupting our day to day lives, even if the news gives it central stage. A battle of bots up above being fought mostly by AI and humans who are there remotely or as uploaded and backed up brain copies might not stop folks leading their normal lives, given that we often succeed in normality even while living in a war zone. It is almost inherent to space settlement that they be built fairly fortified against attack as they essentially exist in a hostile environment to begin with and many planets like Earth will still begin the same because terraforming a planet so people can comfortably live there is a process of many, many generations, even if that world is very Earth-like in lighting, gravity, and composition. They are bunkers, they are airlocked at every door and covered in thick layers of protectants. They are connected by large underground tubes and corridors, 
at least as soon as anyone finally makes a good robotic tunneling device. So too, big industrial wards not only have the resources to rapidly fortify, but would likely already include a lot of fortifications or easily converted facilities. We see this with the planet Armageddon, another place in the 40k setting, that's an industrial titan folks fight over, on and off for 10,000 years too, which is part of how it got the name change to Armageddon from Ulanor. One thing common in sieges that is unlikely in any of these other wards would be a need for outside food production, though you could have planets that were nothing but farms and exported to such planets, so called agri wards that will be the next episode in this series. As we noted in Hive Wards, even without extreme compaction technologies, the amount of food someone needs to eat in a year ought to easily fit inside a cubic meter and mass under a ton, even less if heavily dehydrated. A place expecting to be attacked and fortifying up could have huge underground stockpiles of food imported in advance, like a castle stocking up, and even one cubic kilometer would then contain enough food for a billion people for a year. Mount Everest, hollowed out, would be over a thousand cubic kilometers, enough for a trillion people for a year, and again it is one of roughly one million mountains, albeit the largest. Earth's oceans alone have over a billion cubic kilometers, if that helps clarify the scale here, and it could be dual purpose spaces too, you could have backup supply tunnels between your cities just packed with extra food to be removed if you needed that corridor or you could convert storage facilities into hydroponics or manufacturing facilities. I don't think it would be that crazy to imagine converting entire mountains into huge gun emplacements, or having your command and control live on deep sea subs that prowl the ocean to make it hard for the enemy to launch a decapitation strike. We saw that in the film Terminator Salvation, and it made a good deal of sense even if much of the rest of the film did not, though for the record I liked that film. Indeed on some wards the surface area might be entirely under sea, with no land not covered under kilometers of ocean, and that makes for one heck of a fortification all on its own, especially if it's got floating icebergs you can be using as surface bases and hiding arsenals of surface to orbit nuclear missiles in or under. Here's a few final quick examples to contemplate as we close out. On Europa, submarine cities a kilometer wide prowl the subsurface ocean while skinny tube installations pierce through its 10 kilometer deep surface shell of ice, connecting the various Jovian Galilean nations around Jupiter to the people of those oceans. The sub-Europeans are human-originated genetically engineered mermen and mermaids, and the trade cartels of Europa's ice cylinders defend themselves from Galilean pirates and mermen raiders on both sides of the ice and each tube is a long helix of downward ramps and stairs whose corridors also spin to give extra gravity to augment Europa's own. They can rapidly reassemble into a maze to fool invaders and spies. Intelligence estimates say each of those ice path cylinders has over 10,000 gun emplacements inside, spread roughly every 100 meters at each airlock, and any given 100 meter segment can be rapidly flooded with water or voided to space. At Gamma Crucis, a red giant 88 light years from Earth in the direction of Alpha Centauri, the rebel government is said to keep its base inside a reflective tungsten shell inside the star's upper atmosphere. Inside it uses tungsten sails to cause it to randomly rock around that volume, arriving at prepared coordinates that its allies in the comet belt know so they can fire near-relativistic supply pods for them to capture. The subaltic colonies on Triton used to fund their expansion by using large railguns to fire pods of ice and other volatiles to the inner system habitats needing supplies of air and water. Many of those have now been converted into enormous space guns under the ice, which slowly bore their way through like worms in an apple and have secret positions as a result, but can quickly melt to the surface to fire building-sized ordnance at invaders before retreating to the ice. The guns are so enormous that their defense is countless bunkers built along the outside of the barrels, which also houses a significant civilian population of entire towns. The old near-Earth asteroid mine of Eros was converted to a research lab after it was mined out, with over 10,000 kilometers of abandoned tunnels and storage facilities. The facility was quarantined after the techno-organic lab experiments inside escaped, many of which look like monsters, even demons. 
Because the data inside is considered invaluable, strike teams of marines have been sent in to recover them, and every one of them met their doom inside. Earth in the year 5000 AD is the capital of an empire controlling almost half the solar system and nearly a tenth of interstellar colonies. It's been repeatedly attacked over the years, but any attempted invasion first must fight its way through the 1 million O'Neill cylinders and like number of smaller asteroids converted into defense installations. Use of WMDs in or near Earth, humanity's homeworld, or interfering with the pilgrimages by those wishing to visit, violate treaties signed by nearly every nation in the settled regions of the galaxy. The last invasion attempt utilized 100 trillion marines, kept on ice from their homeworld, to seize enough fortification and habitats to serve as a beachhead to land at an orbital ring. They then managed to fight successfully down almost 3,000 levels of an attached space tower before finally being defeated 127 years after they first struck into cislunar space. There are over a hundred smaller but significant invasions that occurred during this period as well. And lastly, in the sprawling megalopolis of Oberon, which is built into a pocket universe, attackers have to come through corridors which are impossible to map in just three dimensions where up and down change and where time can flow strangely. There are, after all, a lot of ways to fortify a place, and if you can make it unassailable to its neighbors by removing it from normal space-time, that's as good an option as hiding between galaxies, inside the event horizons of black holes, or at the end of the universe. One thing seems sure, as long as there's people there will be conflict, and as long as there's conflict there is a need for defense and who knows what clever techniques for fortifying a world the future will offer us. So we were talking about engineering and fortification today, and one of my favorite things to do as a kid was to build, out of blocks on paper and sometimes just in my imagination if nothing was to hand. There was nothing like hands-on, interactive learning that way, and it's one of the things I instantly loved about Upper Story's new game, Spintronics. It's a chance to learn about electricity through building and connecting gears, meaning you get to learn both in a fun and intuitive way that circuit diagrams just don't allow. Spintronics has wonderful gear equivalents of all the electronic components that you can quickly and easily stick in place with magnets. My kids loved playing it with me and have steadily requested since I first brought it out, and even in a short time have learned a lot. I also love the instructions and puzzles are not just a boring pamphlet but a steampunk themed graphic novel about a young clockmaster learning an alternative technology, electricity. There's a clear dedication to quality design and craftsmanship from Upper Story about every level of the game that I truly appreciate. As we go into the holiday season, if you're looking for a fun and hands-on educational gift for your family or friends, something that can be played in a group or solo, adults or kids, Use the link in the episode description, upwardstory.com slash spintronics to learn more, and don't forget to use coupon code IsaacArthur at checkout to save 10% on your order. So we're done for today, but join us this Sunday for our end of the month livestream Q&A on the 29th. Then we'll start November by visiting the idea of rebel space colonies so often contemplated in sci-fi and futurism and exploring what they might be like. Then it'll be time for our three hour long episode, the Fermi Paradox Compendium of Terms and Solutions on November 9th. We'll follow that on November 12th with our Sci-Fi Sunday where we'll discuss human-alien hybrids like the famous half-Vulcan, half-human science officer Spock from Star Trek, and we'll ask if they could exist and even live long and prosper. Then we'll head to Mars to look at using domes and what they'll be like and how we'll build them. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.